Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending where you are. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 opening for Haskin Hour. I am Uri Koskinen, Associate Dean Research and Business Impact at Haskin School of Business. Uh, in Haskin Hour, we combine faculty experts with business professionals to provide you with unique insights. Today's topic uh, is Are tech firms making excess profits? which is an exciting and important topic globally, as we have been the sky high volatility for tech, tech firms, especially during the early parts of this year. As we broadcast from Calgary, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Siksika, Aigani, and Kainai First Nations, and Suchina First Nation, and the Stony Dakota, including the Shiniki, Berspo, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Metis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Please join us by acknowledging the traditional territories of indigenous peoples in your own locations. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion today. We have a Q&A open, so we encourage you to type in your questions and comments at any time. You may also upload the questions you want to get answered. We may not be able to get to all the questions today, but we will try our best. We have an exciting panel for you today. Danny Chiarastella is a finance leader with Amplify Advisors, a rapidly growing accounting and business consulting and recruiting firm. He acts as a fractional CFO for various private companies. Previously, he was the head of finance Americas for 3P Learning, a global leader in online education, and the CFO of a public traded oil and gas services company. Then he's also a proud Haskell alumnus. Dr. Anup Srivastava is the first Canada research chair at the Haskell School of Business. His research shows how management practices change when knowledge-based companies like Apple or Google have replaced asset-intensive companies such as Ford or Exxon as the most valuable companies in the world. Beyond scholarly publications in top academic journals, Anup has also published over 20 practice-oriented ideas in Harvard Business Review. Dr. Rong Chao, is an associate professor of accounting at the Haskell School of Business. She studies analyst and management forecasts, limitations of financial reporting, and supply chain information. Prior to her academic career, Rong was a certified public accountant licensed in Texas and worked as a tax accountant and a business analyst at Thomson Reuters. The moderator today uh, is Candace Moody, has been accounting instructor and director of the master management program. So Candace, has the recent market turmoil changed anything? Uh, Shopify's valuation has declined by almost 40% since the start of the year. Yeah, that's a great question, Irio. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, the moderator for our first uh, Haskane Hour today. And uh, it's been a great fun uh, preparing and learning and listening to our panelists. So uh, I'm sure that question uh, is at top of mind for our audience today. And I know our panelists have been considering it as well. So I think we're in for, for a fun hour together. So before we uh, do jump into the conversation, uh, we've got a, a poll. Uh, we'll have a few polls throughout our time together this morning, but our first poll here is a question for everyone. Uh, which company uh, made the most profits in 2020? Uh, was it General Motors, Walmart, Citibank, uh, or Facebook? So if you can see the panel on your screen, feel free to click which company you believe uh, to be the one that was the most profitable in 2020. All right. 
Well, there we go. We uh, have a bit of a mixed uh, mixed uh, answers, but uh, Anoop, I know that uh, you know the right answer and can shed some light on, on this question. So over to you. Well, thank you. Looks like uh, most of the people got it right, uh, almost 62%. Uh, thanks, Candice, great to be here. Uh, well, to answer the, the, the question, uh, uh, it's not a valid comparison at all. And let me explain why. Facebook's 2020 profits were same as the three other companies put together, the three 20th century giants put together. That's Walmart plus General Motors plus Citibank. If that surprises you, consider this fact. Microsoft made twice the profits of Facebook and Apple made three times the profits of Facebook. Again, let's consider the facts that are well known. And this is despite the tech meltdown area. Uh, yes, uh, we have lost, uh, we lost about 12% in NASDAQ over the last couple of days. Still, the aggregate market capitalization of tech giants, just five or six tech giants, that is Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Google, and Microsoft put together is $9 trillion. $9 trillion, to put that in perspective, was the same as aggregate market capitalization of all companies listed on stock exchanges in late 90s, all companies versus six tech giants. Again, to put $9 trillion in perspective, that is same as GDP of Canada, plus GDP of France, plus GDP of Germany. $9 trillion, or lots of money. So they must be making pots of gold, right? Danny, what do you think? Some uh, mind-blowing stats for sure, uh, Noop. And yeah, again, pleasure to be here as well. Um, let me ask the question is, uh, are we wasting our time? Like how relevant are these financials today that we are spending literally hundreds of hours preparing, especially in this era of tech companies uh, dominating the marketplace? So, you know, in fact, where have these profits gone? And even that concept of profits is, is really more of a recent phenomenon in the tech sector. And I think, you know, COVID has some has definitely had an impact on that for sure. There was an August 21 article that was called COVID saved tech companies, otherwise not profitable. And they were saying there was a stat from CNBC. Uh, this was back in 2018 that only 17% of those companies, tech companies were in fact profitable. So I think on the investor calls right now, we're, we're, what we're seeing is uh, investors wanting to get to the, the good stuff on these earnings call, not sort of the boring, irrelevant balance sheet income, state, income statements of, of the day. It's okay, I'm an accountant, I can say stuff like that. <laughs> we'll put that into a little perspective a little bit here, but it's not that the financials are difficult to read. I think it's because the meat, as I like to call it, is everywhere else, right? They're now in the notes and the NDNAs, the management discussion is, is what that is, the annual reports and lots of supplemental data that companies are now putting out to, I guess, inform investors. But uh, obviously there's some, you know, beware of what is out there. We'll get to that in a bit, but let's get back to like, where did these profits go? And uh, Rong is going to explain a little bit to us, in fact, uh, where they have gone. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Great points there. I think I'll start on a slightly lighter note. Uh, I'll start by paraphrasing a bit done by the comedian Ronnie Chen. Okay, so here is how it goes. We live in the land of the free and the land of never leaving your house. So what does that mean? Well, we have Amazon, right? So nothing is too small, too trivial to be hand delivered into your house like an emperor. We cannot get enough of Amazon Prime. Now we need Prime now. What does that mean? When we press buy, we want the items in our hands. So where do we go from here? Next thing we know, we're going to have Prime before. So send me everything I want before I even want it in as many boxes as possible, right? So I think I have established that most of us as consumers, we really love the products and services provided by tech companies, either for free or at very low cost to us, right? But now let's look at this from the company's perspective. So when Amazon was charging $79 a year for each Prime membership, it was estimated that it cost Amazon $90 a year. So $55 in shipping and another 35 in digital videos. Now that means the company took an $11 loss every year for each membership. So altogether, it was estimated that Amazon was losing one to $2 billion a year. 
on Prime membership. So why does Amazon do it? If we go back all the way to 1997, we read its letter to shareholders, we will understand. So what they were saying is that they were going to ignore short-term profits and they were going to instead obsessively focusing on how fast and how big they can grow. That means they're going to lose money just to gain market share. As Jeff Bezos said at some point, when Amazon wins a golden globe, they can sell more shoes. So that's how Amazon becomes so dominant today. And Amazon's dominance, as well as the dominance of other tech giants, are causing a lot of concerns among policymakers today. So I think today what we want to ask, what the hard question for us to think about is, now is that dominance coming from anti-competitive behavior or is it coming from genuine innovation? So I think uh, today's discussion will get our audience thinking about these issues. And I'm also eager to hear what our audience think. So hopefully we'll get some audience participation later. Okay, Candice, back to you. Yeah, great questions. And I think, you know, anti-competitive anti behavior or uh, genuine in innovation, uh, either way, because I'm an accountant, I think, well, where, where do we show this? Um, and I think, I wonder, Anip, what do you think? Where do, where do we show this value? How do we show, or Danny, you said it's, you know, the meat is somewhere else. So, uh, you know, tell me more about where we can see what this, what, where this value is. Go ahead, Anup. Yeah. Sorry, Danny, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, I mean, again, there's a lot of the supplemental stuff now that the, that the companies are publishing. It's, it's also within what we call now KPIs, so sort of key performance indicators, right? So it's not always about now net income and maybe even if you go to a balance sheet where you're not going to find a lot of these intangible assets that these companies have built over time. So there's all these other measures, you know, EBIT does a classic earnings before interest tax depreciation. But there's also many forms of that, right? Adjusted EBITDA, adjusted cash, like we can go on and on. So it is a bit of a buyer beware when it comes to those things. So you've got to understand when you're utilizing those kinds of metrics, you kind of understand where they're coming from. Yeah, Nupa. Yeah, so let's let's take Facebook as a classic example. We're talking about a value that's close to a trillion dollars. Okay, and if Facebook buys a table or a chair, it's presented on the balance sheet. But we all know that its biggest asset is 2.8 billion subscribers on Earth. The network of those subscribers and the data that it gets. So ultimately, we finance people would like to know what money does it make from that 2.8 billion subscriber network? And it boils down to the ads that it shows to those people. So we get into what is called as unit economics. So we try to figure out that if a person spends one hour on Facebook, let's consider that as a unit, what is the value of advertisement that we can show to that person? So that's the top line, that's the revenue. And what is the cost that Facebook has to incur to show that ad? And that's, let, let's say it's close to negligible. So we have revenues, costs, and then we have to look at what is the total addressable market. Between Facebook and Google, they have almost 70% of US advertising revenues. That's a large number. So that's revenues minus costs that gives you profits. And the value is a function of what are the future profits. So what is the total addressable market that they can address? And through some complicated cal calculations, we can sort of work out what is the present value of future cash flows. But the bottom line is that the value of that five point, not sorry, 3.8 billion subscribers is nowhere to be found, found on the balance sheet of Facebook. Wrong, what do you think? Well, I think you both made very solid points. I think now is actually the perfect time for our audience to chime in. So we have two more poll questions coming up. Okay, so Sherry, would you please pull up the poll questions? All right, so we've got two polls here that we're hoping that we can hear from the audience. So the first one is asking, uh, what do you think is the average return on assets? And that's calculated as profit divided by assets for uh, informa information technology industries. Is it 7%, 0% or negative 50%? So tying back to Danny's talking about a KPI, you know, return on assets, this is an important KPI that uh, many users of uh, information technology companies are using um, and knowing, you know, a little bit about what's on those financial statements, profit and assets both can be found, found there. 
Um, the other question is, and we've got a chart here. So you might need uh, to expand your window to make sure that you can see five columns for the second question. Um, the color blocks in this image indicate three categories of assets uh, that we recognize on a balance sheet. Uh, one being PP&E, property, plant, and equipment. Uh, two being intangibles and goodwill. And three other assets. And so we are wanting uh, for you to pick which color uh, you believe is the intangibles and goodwill uh, for each of these companies. And uh, for uh, just a refresh, we, we define intangibles according to accounting rules as an asset that isn't physical in nature, but we uh, you know, expect it will generate future economic value to the company. So you know, something like a trademark or a copyright is, uh, usually falls under that category. Uh, similarly, goodwill is uh, another asset uh, and it simply is the premium that a company would have paid uh, to acquire another company. Uh, so just simply choose blue, green, or orange, uh, whichever one you believe to represent uh, our intangibles and goodwill of these five different companies. All right, so look at that. The first question, we're a bit divided on what that ROA or return on uh, assets is. So uh, please tell us more. Um, okay, so uh, Anup and Danny, if you don't mind, I will take a couple of minutes to walk everybody through this. I think it will solidify some of the points you guys were saying earlier. Okay, so the first question, the information technology industries, actually they make average near to nothing, near to zero return on assets. Now the six to 7%, that's typical for consumer discretionary, for consumer stables industries. And that minus 50%, that's the average for the healthcare sector. Okay, so uh, the second question, the correct answer is the Orange block. Okay, that's a trick question. If I have a question like that on the exam, students will complain, right? It's a trick question. Uh, let me walk you through. Okay, so the first question. Now, why are we seeing near 0%? So this is a result of the current accounting rules. So as Candace explained earlier, in terms of what we mean by intangible assets, uh, we are looking at companies, especially high tech companies, investing, making a lot of investments in developing brand value, in uh, expanding customer base, in attracting top talents to come up with new products, innovative products. But the accounting rule says, if you make these investments internally, guess what? You cannot recognize them on your balance sheet as an asset. Instead, these expenditures are recognized as either R&D expense or SGNA expense, which means it's going to bring down your profits. So the more you make those investments that you benefit in the future, the lower your profit will look. And in healthcare, we have a lot of biotech companies their business model is to develop their product, right? So they put in R&D. Okay, so the second question here, I am actually not surprised that most of you pick the blue block, okay? Now, because if you look at blue, it's a big chunk of the total assets, right? And if you look at Apple, well, Apple doesn't even have an orange block. It does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. How is it possible that Apple as one of the most valued companies on this planet doesn't have a big chunk of intangible asset. We all know how valuable that simple logo is, right? Uh, an apple with one bite out of it. How is it possible it's not there? Well, that's because Apple is doing a lot of internal investments. So they are not allowed to recognize those on their balance sheet as assets, okay? So uh, there's another subtle, more subtle message here I want to point out. Now the accounting rules, uh, the accounting rules do allow the following scenario. If you buy another company or if you buy intangible assets, you can recognize them as acquired intangible assets 
and goodwill. So if you guys remember, Facebook purchased WhatsApp in 2014, right? I think they paid about what, $17 billion. And out of that 17 billion, almost 90% is allocated to goodwill. So if you look at these tech giants, you see minor differences here, right? So you see Microsoft and Facebook, they have a bigger chunk of the orange block because they are doing a lot of uh, acquisition. So if you look at our next slides here, so what we have here, we have superimposed the market capitalization on firms' total assets, right? As Anub and Daniel were saying, these companies are so valuable, but 80% of their market capitalization is not reflected in their assets. So what's happening here? What do you guys think? The purple block, by the way, the purple block is the percentage of market cap that is not reflected in financial, in accounting numbers. Well, the result okay. is quite simple. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a metric such as price to book ratio or market to book ratio. So if it goes, it goes back to people who do something called as value investing, and they do value investing based on price to book ratio, that is, is price above the book value? And if prices go back to 1940s or 30s, the rule was if your price is greater than book value, then buy, then it's actually overvalued. You should, you should so short sell the stock. We are talking about price to book ratios of 15 is to 1, 20 is to 1. Just Let's just pause to think, 15 is to 1, what does it mean? That means book value is not wrong by 15% or 20%. It is wrong by 15 times. Okay, so 1 15th of the value or 1 20th of the value that market consider as value is presented on the balance sheet. Well, if a balance sheet presents only 1 50th of what is priced by the investors, who's going to use that number? So Danny says, give me the exciting stuff. Don't give me that boring balance sheet because even if they don't present anything on the balance sheet, I'm willing to disregard it. In fact, just to build on Rong's point, when Facebook pays for WhatsApp customers, that value is presented on Facebook's balance sheet. But Facebook's own customers, 2.8 billion people on earth, who spend two hours a day, every day on Facebook, that helps Facebook make profits, that is not presented on the balance sheet because it is internally developed. Anything that is internally developed is useless, as far as accountants are concerned, not only it is useless, that actually brings down your profits. So if it brings down your profits, the more you spend on your future, the lesser is the profits you report. So Danny again says, I'm going to disregard this profit, profit and loss <laughs> account because this, the more a person spends on, a company spends on building its future, the higher are its reported losses. So I'm going to disregard p &L account. I'm going to disregard balance sheet. And I'm going to look for exciting stuff. Right, Danny? <laughs> exactly. But I mean, yeah, we've got to go back a little bit too to say, you know, the accounting rules largely have not changed in a in, in number of years. But what has certainly changed is there is a lot more intangibles that have come up now. Like that list has grown exponentially. Like we probably even think five, 10 years ago that the amount of intangibles what's being created today probably wasn't even, I mean, kind of enter our minds now, right? So a lot of this is happening. It's developing. It'll continue to develop. So I think we're going to see is probably some closer looks at, at, at how, how that's happening. It's funny. Cause you go to like the world come example, they were trying to push as much off their P and like off their income statement to their balance sheet to make their earnings look like, like charged up. Right. But we knew that they were, you know, they were obviously crossing a line there. Right. So you, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of controversy there is, you know, there's a, there could be a fine line too, between, you know, between that too. But, it, but again, you know, balance sheets are good for, you know, brick and mortars business. It's easy, right? You look at a Walmart and, and some articles that I was looking at, and I think a noop and uh, you were, you know, author behind a, a lot of those studies and, you know, th those are easier to sort of visualize. You can touch it, you can feel it, you know, you can put your hands around it, but these other things uh, like crypto, like, yeah, a lot of the stuff value of a, of a user or a subscriber, right? It's a little trickier, <laughs> for sure. Well, so uh, I'm an accounting professor, right? So I, I, I have to come out and defend accounting a little bit. Okay, so uh, 
what we were looking at earlier, we were talking about numbers on the financial statements, right? We're talking about four major financial statements. But if you look at every annual report, as Denny said earlier, annual report is easily over 100 pages or sometimes 200 pages, right? So which means there's a lot in the annual report. So I do agree that accounting numbers do have limitations because rules are always lagging behind a little bit. Let me make an analogy, right? We are in the COVID era, which means the science is always playing catch up. So there's a new variant and the science is trying to figure out, okay, what is this new variant? How do we treat it? Same thing with accounting rules. There's a little bit of a lag, but there is a lot of information in the financial uh, statements in the annual reports, 10 case. So what I think is that financial statement analysis has to change. It has to go beyond these four statements with just the profits, with the assets. So for example, well, we were talking about Anoop, we, uh, you were talking about clicks, right? So it's actually quite helpful for a company like Facebook to provide, for example, uh, cost per click. Or if we have marketing people in the audience here, they talk about impressions, impressions per click. Mm -hmm. So if companies provide things like that, these are value relevant information. But I will also acknowledge that when different companies provide different things, it makes comparison across companies quite difficult. So what do you guys think? Well, I too, wrong. I uh, empathize with being an accounting instructor where we try and tell them that the financial statements tell the story of the company and, and how they've performed and you know, the types of decisions they made that year. And you know, this makes me more and more worried that the gap of what is actually happening and, and where they're supposed to tell their story continues to widen. Um, and you know, I take your point, Danny, that you know, the, the meat and the exciting things are in things like the MDNA, uh, things like the annual report. But to your point, wrong, those are long. And now I'm worried when I hear the word adjusted, EBITDA, and adjusted this and these other KPIs, that they can kind of, you know, can they? Can they just decide how they want to calculate those because they aren't dictated by the accounting standards? And will that further kind of widen this gap of, of you know, actual performance and the story they want or have chosen to tell their, their users? Yeah, so let me take a stab at it. Uh, uh, the, the fact is that companies are not even revealing that information. Okay. Uh, in fact, one of my Harvard Business Review articles, we actually interviewed the tech CFOs and they're collecting a lot of information. Of course, if it creates value, then they're collecting the information. You know, how, just a simple example, like what is the network of subscribers? What numbers are added this year? What is the attrition rate? What is the value of subscriber located in North America versus, let's say, Africa or Asia? How many hours are they spending? What is the ad value per subscriber? What is the cost for that subscriber? Uh, so th th they're collecting a lot of information and that is useful. And, and I'm an accounting professor too, like uh, you uh, and wrong. Uh, but you know, the fact is that why, if this is the information that investors are looking for and we cannot summarize it in the form of those financial statements, which is at the end of the day, what is the firm's balance sheet, which is assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity. And what is the income statement is revenues minus costs equals profits. If we cannot summarize it, do we really need the amount of efforts that goes in production of those summary numbers, get it audited and get it out in time? Why don't we simply provide that information that investors are looking for? In fact, there's an excellent question from the audience, uh, the value of network, the network, the more that it creates, the competitive advantage that it creates. Why don't, uh, why don't these companies provide the information that Danny's of the world are looking for in a summarized form, in a Q&A format, rather than spend the time and resources that, is, that goes into preparation of financial statements? Danny? Yeah, I think one uh, new, obviously there's, it's still regulatory that sits in behind, right? Publicly traded companies have to abide by regulatory, you know, there's requirements to say, okay, this is what you need to disclose. I think those also presents as an account, you know, it's presenting opportunities to us to rethink some of this kind of stuff, right? 
because we know what investors are after. I see some comments there and yeah, look at the shareholders of these companies as well and, and, and who they are. So it is important factors there, but yeah, again, presenting some opportunities, right? Maybe. And in some of the articles I was looking at in particular, the CPA Ontario study on, you can't touch us the intangible asset debate of which Anoop was a co-author of that as well. Right. But is, is talking about some of this, right? Like, could we be looking at this in a, in a bit, bit of a different light now? But I think, yes, we have to provide more, even as accountants as well. It's, yes, the balance sheet, think of saving the cash flow, great. I like saving my cash flows because I can get to some of those uh, finite things and some of those accounting things get sort of tossed out the window and you can see how's the company doing. But um, the need and the want of information or what's going to be required or people want to look for, I mean, it's only going to keep growing, right? Like we know that. So I think, you know, we'll even have to change, you know, our mindsets a little bit too, you know, around that. Yeah, so let me just address the regulation uh, part where you said that we are doing because it is required by regulation. And in fact, a lot is being done just because it is required by regulation. It is not creating value for the society. So we look at three primary users of financial statements. It's investors, it's banks, and it is uh, a use for employee contracting, that is CEO compensation. So if it is not being used for investor decision-making, that is buy and sell decision. If it is not being used by lenders, if your asset number is wrong, you know, those who are who understand lending, lending business, debt service, debt service coverage ratio, interest coverage ratio, debt to equity ratio, those ratios are wrong. And then finally, let's look at CEO contracting. 85% of CEO compensation now comes from stock-based compensation. And even that 10 or 15% that comes from profit-based number, that's the bonus part, as Danny, you rightly use the word, it comes from adjusted EBITDA. And adjustments <laughs> is limited by your imagination. What all you want to include, what you want to exclude. So my question is, yes, for compliance sake, we are preparing those financial statements. But who's using them? And for what purpose? Well, so my view is that... Uh, it is actually quite difficult to come up with a set of rules that can be one size fits all, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in today's environment, if you look at some of these uh, big tech companies, it's very hard to summarize everything because they are in so many different things. So uh, Amazon is doing what? They are selling goods online, right? They're online retailer. And what else are they doing? They're a online marketplace. They are providing a platform for small sellers. And they are even starting uh, Amazon Salon in London, right? They have a virtual reality brick and mortar salon where you can go in and try out different hairstyles. So it's hard to come up with something that will fit everybody. So we might be looking at a situation where everybody is presenting what is suitable for them. So I agree, it's going to be hard for uh, small investors to understand that summary numbers may not be that useful for them. But I'm hoping that Danny's of the world, you know, the financial intermediaries, analysts, they have the expertise and they have the modern tools of machine learning and data analytics, big data. So hopefully they are going to be able to tease out these different varieties of information and perhaps summarize a lot of them. So you and me, small investors on the market can gain knowledge from their analysis. And when I look in the chat, uh, one of our uh, audience members, Hussein, has uh, reminded us that the auditors have to read the annual report and make sure there's nothing you know, in, you know, directly conflicting with the knowledge they've obtained. So I think thanks Hussein for that good reminder. Mm -hmm. um, and then he also says, you know, there are very few, albeit rich giant tech companies and analysts that follow the companies and they do incorporate, you know, incorporate, you know, intangibles and goodwill in their analysis. So 99% of companies still need these regular accounting numbers. Uh, he would claim they're being used and another audience member reminded us that, you know, we also need these, these um, accounting numbers as the start of our tax returns. And so they are being used for, for taxes as well. So I guess there are people out there that are using them. And it seems like uh, users who are following at least those in this uh, tech in, uh, industry, you know, are, are knowledgeable in what's happening. Um, 
I think back to your, your uh, earlier question, uh, Rong, on, you know, is this dominance that we're now seeing and our numbers have, you know, these charts that we have shown um, within the tech number, you know, what tech industry, is it because of this uh, anti-competitive behavior? Is it because of genuine innovation? And, uh, you know, there's a question here from Michael that, you know, leads us to talk about you know, with these large tech companies, once the network in place, it becomes astro astronomically expensive for competitors to challenge them, right? I, how, who can uh, challenge Apple and Facebook at this point in time? So he's wondering, do we see any ways to re-stimulate the competition uh, okay. of other market the participants within these companies? Um, and what's the role of antitrust or competitive regulation in, in all of this? That's a mm. great question. <laughs> Well, who remembers MySpace? Anyone? MySpace. So MySpace was accused of being the monopoly power at some point, uh, not in the not too distant past, maybe 10 years ago. And does anybody use MySpace today? So uh, I think Mike made a very valid point. They have dominance, Facebook has dominance, but we cannot predict what will be the next innovative product that will come up and that's going to take the market share away from Facebook. And I'm sure we still all remember the good old days when the flip phone was the hip device to have, right? I even had a Palm Pilot, but hey, everybody these days, <laughs> we are using <laughs> iPhones, Samsung, right? So the competition is truly very dynamic. So today's dominance doesn't mean tomorrow's dominance. Mm -hmm. Anoop, I think you will agree on that, right? Yeah, so uh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, because yes, uh, because uh, you know, creative destruction is a part of corporate life. Uh, new things come along and uh, you know, as, as you rightly said, Nokia was once the dominant phone player and now we have Samsung's and Apple's of the world. But in the process, uh, we have also created some, at least as of now it looks like, we have created some modes which are impregnable. It's impossible to enter. So if you have 2.8 billion subscribers on earth uh, and you control any possible competitor that comes along, you just gobble them up. Uh, WhatsApp is gobbled up, Instagram is gobbled up. Uh, there is low likelihood that a new person or a new company will come along, especially given this winner takes all. So winner takes all, you have all the revenues in the world. That's what I started with, huge profits that Facebook is making. And after that, about they're spending almost nine to 10% of their revenues on R&D. Which new company can match nine to 10% spent by these tech giants on R&D? You know, that's like the whole market put together is R&D of these tech giants put together. So how does one come out with a new company, especially given their tight control? So they are not only controlling the highway, they're also controlling the choke points. Choke points means anytime information comes in and the information goes out, they're controlling it. To, for a new competitor to come in, you need fair competition. So Nokia was overtaken by Apple and Samsung because there was a fair competition. Today, as we know, Amazons of the world, they not only control the highway, they control it fully. Because if any competitor comes along, or if any supplier doesn't play with their games, they indulge in anti, anti you know, non-fair practices, and they do not even prevent that company to become any, to reach that size where they can, they can offer a viable competition. So I think that's a very valid point that has been raised in the, in the chat, that yes, they were innovative companies, but had they reached a situation where they're controlling the highway and all the choke points are the highway so that there's no place for a new competitor to come in. That's actually a great uh, point. Uh, I will mention one thing. Uh, it wasn't my piece. It was raised by Lina Khan, who is a legal scholar and she's now the chairperson of the FTC. So her thinking is the following, right? So we are worried about monopoly, but in today's digital economy, the reality is that these companies are almost competing in the oligopoly fashion, right? So there's a term called co cooperation. So I can talk about that a little bit more later. But Lina Khan's point is, 
in the current antitrust framework, it's mostly about consumer welfare. That's why uh, from legal perspective, it's very hard to uh, prosecute or, you know, it, it's very hard for DOJ to win cases against these digital giants because consumers are benefiting. But Lena Khan's thinking is that perhaps we need to think about these companies such as Amazon as a public utility. Now, why is that? Because essentially they are providing infrastructure, they are providing network for the internet economy. Right? So if we think of them as public utility, for example, we regulate water, we regulate electricity and gas, we regulate transportation such as railroads, right? These are public utility, meaning we can accept their dominance uh, as a benefit, but then we can come up with uh, ways of regulating how they use their power. Now, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to see how what, what she is going to do at the FTC. Uh, I don't think it's going to be an easy task. Wow. Yeah, so the whole notion of uh, antitrust uh, law, uh, doctrine as it has evolved, at least in the United States, is harm to the customer, immediate harm to the customer. So if, if a customer is getting the product free, uh, you know, why would we complain? Uh, we get a product free from Facebook or from Google, why would we complain? But I think Lina Khan wants to change the doctrine where we're talking about, it goes back to the anti-competitive practices. Uh, I'm glad Rangi brought railroads where it is the size, the dominant size, which has potential to harm. I think the discussion started from this point, can the new competitors come up? Is it possible that a new company becomes a, a Facebook of tomorrow? or Amazon of tomorrow. And the way things stand today, given the stronghold that these companies have, especially controlling the choke points, the likelihood is very low, even though customers are benefiting. And, the, and, and numerous cases, especially European Union has, you know, European Union has gone after these tech giants and has successfully find these companies. For example, Google provides search. It provides search results. And then it says, if you want to buy these, pro these products, what is your first choice? Please go to Google store. They will, they, they will provide the search results. So they are acting as an impartial search engine, but then they nudge you to go to their own Google store where they earn commissions from the potential sales. So they're trying to be judge, jury, as well as prosecutors all put together. And this is what Lena Khan is after. So Danny, do you do you think that we can there be room, there can be a way for new competition? I mean, yeah, in a capital economy, this is what you know ends up happening. But you do see spin outs. You know, you look at agri industry now, you go into the local Safeway now. Now they all these little like growth, growth things like right in the aisles, you can go buy your herbs and whatever. They grow it in this cool little thing, then you go down the aisle, you, you purchase that. So there's there's spins that are happening food industry is as well. We were talking in New Bright discussions about these cloud kitchens that are now popping up, right? These chefs doing this stuff at home, right? And then you're buying this stuff. Like, so there'll probably, I think that there is room. There's probably some offshoots that happen. Will they get garbled, like gobbled up by the big giants? Probably will still keep happening. I mean, that is just, that's the world we live in here, right? And as when you try to tighten regulation around, right? Then there is some uproar that occurs and there is some pushback that happens. And then there's spin outs that and different things and ideas that are spun out of that. But yeah, there's some challenges there. Do I think, I think so. I think uh, we, we might see different streams of things. Maybe who only knows, right? Like uh, ideas get spun up every day and uh, yeah, my thoughts on it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I actually want to circle back to the term that I brought up earlier, co-opetition. So what does that mean? That means there is competition, brutal competition, but there is also cooperation. So a couple of points I want to make. Number one, if you think about the benefits coming from some of the dominance of these uh, tech giants. So for example, Facebook, if I play devil's advocate, they would say that, hey, prior to Facebook days, if you are not a huge company that can afford to do TV ads, it's very hard for you to reach local market, right? Or even just expand beyond your local market. But today, there's Facebook. They provide low cost ads to small players so they can expand their business. And another point is, well, Facebook is in fierce 
competition with uh, companies such as Google because they compete on in terms of the ad space, right? How many ads they are selling. So there is fierce competition. But what we do need to worry about is cooperation to the extent that it's going to damage consumer or smaller players. So I think Google got into trouble. Uh, DOJ was pursuing Google. They filed a suit against Google because Google was paying about almost $10 billion a year to Apple for Apple to essentially build their search engine into Apple product. So we have to be a little bit worried about these cozy links. So that's what we need to be concerned about. But I think there is fierce competition among the tech giants. Uh, Google is doing Google Cloud. Microsoft is doing uh, Microsoft Azure, and they are all trying to compete with Amazon cloud services, right? Okay. Yeah, so yes, there is a little bit of competition uh, among these tech giants. Uh, so for example, when we think about future, uh, currently the AI, uh, the, the biggest, uh, biggest research is being done by Microsoft versus Apple. When you're talking about Meta, it is the biggest research is being done by Facebook, versus Apple. When you talk about car companies, the future car companies, we are talking about Tesla versus Google's Waymo. But it ultimately boils down to these couple of tech giants. Why is it that our life should be controlled by these four or five tech giants? This is where I said their total market capitalization is same as GDP of three of the largest, some of the largest nations put together. The combined market power that they have so we know that biotechnology is, you know, ultimately, let's think about COVID. Who, you know, how did we survive? We survived using Moderna, uh, the, the, the Pfizer, which was BioNTech, and AstraZeneca. All three were small biotech companies. They innovated. They created the product. Pfizer did not create that product. It was BioNTech which created that product. Mm -hmm. Now we we see that the, the the innovation in the in the in the whole global economy is controlled by these four or five players. And again, again, let me repeat that fact that the total R and D dollars that these giants spent, or if anybody develops something new, it's gobbled up by these tech giants. These tech giants are serial acquirers. They're acquiring companies by tons and which are, which don't even appear because these are small, small deals. If they can't acquire the companies, they acquire people that's called acqui hires that these small shops with small entrepreneurs that create something, they come and make such attractive offer. Just think about $17 billion that they paid for WhatsApp. I'm sure the founders of WhatsApp don't even know how many zeros are there in $17 billion, but they come and write that check like Godfather, you know, write an amount that you only think of, <laughs> but you haven't heard, you haven't seen before. They come and gobble them up. This is the prevention, you know, innovation economy is based on creative destruction. Old order destroy, is destroyed and new order is created. That is not happening. And the future is controlled by these three or four tech giants. Yes, they are competing, but in a competitive way, in a cooperative way, and the likelihood of a new player emerging, becoming the next Facebook or a next Amazon or the next Google is very, very dim as of now. Oh very, very dim. That, <laughs> that makes me worried. I know, but there's lots of worry here as I put my user financial statements hat on. But, you know, we've got to be a lot more educated on what isn't on the financial statements. Now I'm thinking as a user of all these services, I'm not going to click on the first link that comes up in my Google search because, yeah, now I know what's happening. Um, so I think, we, you know, we've, we've had a lot of conversation. There is dominance and, you know, lots of reasons why there is. Um, we do have a few um, questions flooding in the chat that maybe aren't particularly related to just what we we're talking about, but I think it would be interesting to uh, see your perspective or if uh, any of you know, uh, Alice is asking us, okay, we, you know, do we see similar patterns of assets on the books versus market value that uh, we have shown in our last slide to the audience? Um, in companies that target businesses as customers? Uh, or is this gap between book and market uh, less extreme? Sorry, I couldn't understand the question. Uh, Do we see similar patterns of assets on the books versus market value uh, in companies that target businesses as, cu as customers? 
Okay, so is, is it B two B versus B two C? Perhaps yeah. that's the yeah, question. Sort of yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think the question comes down to what is the value and what is presented on the balance sheet. Let's understand what is balance sheet before we can answer this question. Any time a company spends a dollar on atoms and molecules, they could be land, building, machines, warehouses, uh, security equipment that is capitalized. Anything that, as Danny has rightly said, if anything is spent on something that you cannot touch, uh, th that is uh, th that is expensed as incurred, that is reported mm -hmm. as a cost. It is not reported on the balance sheet. So, if a company is developing relationships. Uh, uh, exclusive tie-ups. It could be B2B. It could be exclusive relationships. Sometimes exclusive relationships. Sometimes think about getting an, a, a very lucrative mining contract. All right. It's a. It's it's not even B2B. It's a B2G a business with government. That extreme. That is extremely valuable, and company can capitalize on that and make money forever. So that is. That may not be presented as an asset on the balance sheet. I come from you know third world country, and I know that often companies pay bribes to get those lucrative contracts. Uh, that's a big asset for the company, and it's going to. So I think the distinction: the companies that have high price to book ratio are the ones that do not spend on atoms and molecules. Mm -hmm. They develop on certain capabilities or certain soft assets that will potentially help them earn profits or make them more attractive acquisition targets. So tomorrow, a, a Microsoft or a Google or a Facebook will come and write them a check of 20 or $30 billion. If you spend on those assets, then it is not presented on balance sheet, and you have high price to book ratio. You spend on atoms and molecules, it is presented on balance sheet. Great. So this isn't just a tech, tech industry uh, discrepancy or difference that we're seeing then. Yeah, no, no, I don't think it is at all. Yeah, because yeah, you're right. There's all these other companies out there and are generating these kinds of things. That's why I think it, there's probably a bit of a relook at that will end up occurring. I think at, at some point in time, you know, who 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 knows how soon that will be or not. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, Denver, oh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, the, the you know let's the, this in a way people say that this network. You know, the whole idea about networks being the key uh, asset for modern tech companies. Uh, I mean, this is something that has historically existed. Uh, for example, railways, you know, think about railways created a network. Now they control the highway and they, if they own the stations and they control the rail, railroad cars, they basically control the whole traffic. All right. And again, it goes back to the only difference is those assets are presented on the balance sheet because railroads networks are made of atoms and molecules the current uh, uh, uber network or airbnb network or facebook network or linkedin network is not made of atoms and molecules therefore it is not presented we've got a question from the audience saying hey what about tech firms from china could they ever compete with the top four or five thoughts oh well <laughs> I can see this is from an anonymous uh, participant. Well, uh, tech firms in China, obviously there are sensitive issues uh, because in China they have a whole other set of rules, right? It's not like the US or Canada, the whole environment. So they do have tech giants there. We all have heard of Alibaba. And I use an app called WeChat. I don't know whether you guys have heard of it. It's essentially, how should I describe it? Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, uh, Apple Pay, whatever, everything combined in one single app. It's so convenient. People there use WeChat a lot in their everyday life. And they don't even carry a wallet anymore because there's no need. You just carry a phone and you can go wherever, right? Now, they do have competition there, but of course, in that kind of environment, you are dealing with a central government and central government has a lot of uh, regulatory power. So it's a little different from what we see here. Now, do they compete with our top five, top four here? Well, they, they do. In fact, we know TikTok, right? TikTok is start, well, TikTok started uh, in China, it was 
invented by a Chinese company and it became popular in China before it became popular here. I heard of TikTok from my nieces, okay? I had no clue whatsoever. I was like, what is this thing called Douyin? That's in Chinese and it's TikTok here. And after they have been using it for quite a long time, it came here. And now TikTok competes with YouTube. I'm sure young and hip kids today, they use TikTok more than YouTube, right? So they do compete. But again, there is the unique regulatory environment there in China. So I don't think we have time to get into that today. Yeah, in summary, the DPRs, the data protection regulation in China is different. So the data, which is the new gold or new oil, whatever you want to call it, is partly controlled by government. Uh, and this is where I was saying, you can't break into Facebook's network because they control personal data, even though it belongs to you and me. By the way, I'm not on Facebook, but if I was, my data will belong to Facebook, but it will not belong to government. But in China, it partly belongs to government. And that's the difference. So I also mentioned one thing, right? Earlier we talked about cooperation. Now you guys know Apple and Facebook got into a tussle, right? Because Apple is going to require apps to ask users for permission to track their data, which means now for these companies to expand further, they have to gain consumers trust in terms of how companies use their data. I think that's what Apple is saying, at least why they're doing it. They're trying to protect consumer privacy because for Apple really selling iPhones, iPads, and MacBook, that's a big chunk of uh, their revenue, their profits. So I think- But wrong, is, is it really effective? You know, all of us have been on website and they asked us, do you accept our cookie policies? How many of us have said, no. <laughs> well, I actually have started trying. I actually okay. started going to individual ones and decline off. <laughs> Well, I, I guess uh, it is hard, but I think we do have some control over our own personal data. So we should be more cognizant of how much data we allow them to track. It's kind of creepy when you were just talking to a friend about a product and all of, all of a sudden that ad showed up on your phone, right? So <laughs> next time we should think a little bit more about how we use internet, I guess. Absolutely, I think this has provided us I know provided me a lot to think about as a user of multiple different things. Now we can add a user of apps to, to my list of things I you know, probably should think more about before clicking and uh, accepting uh, or advancing to the next thing. So um, you know, I, think, I think we have one question left in the Q&A, but I'm also getting the, the cue in my uh, chat to wrap it up and uh, uh, hand it back to Yurio to conclude this uh, house gain hour. Thank you very much, Candice. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining us today. We had 96 participants in the webinar across Canada and beyond. And uh, as a reminder, a recording of today's uh, program will be available on our website uh, next, sometime next week. So I had no idea that talking about accounting would be so much fun. I mean, we always think about accounting is so dry, but hey, this was a lively and great discussion. So what we learned that financial statements are largely irrelevant for the new economy firms is based on the balance sheet because it doesn't really uh, reflect the intangible assets that has been developed uh, in-house. Uh, income statement, maybe a little bit more relevant. Net income in income statement is not relevant, but maybe some cash flow or EBITDA, uh, different ways of measuring profitability could be still be useful for new economy uh, firms. Uh, and there's a definite need for new accounting rules, bringing, bringing accounting uh, to the 21st century. Right now, we are very good at dealing with 20th century firms that are still, of course, important, but the new economy firms, the accounting rules are not that in, in important except for, for uh, tax uh, purposes. The interesting topic that we really think really is uh, consensus is that if, if these companies are making excess profits, is it due to innovation or, or, or market power? So is this good for consumers in the long run or is this a uh, dominance for four or five few firms really strifling future innovation and future competition? That's going to be a big topic going forward. As a reminder, I will be 
I mentioned, we will be hosting our next Haskane Hour in April or May. So please remember to check your inbox for your invitations uh, to join. And I would also like to remind you that you will be getting an evaluation survey in your email. Please look for it and send it in our, our way. Uh, and finally, thank you for our excellent panelists today, Danny, Anup, and Ron. And thank you, our excellent moderator, Candice. And audience, thank you for joining us. I'm very glad that you were able to join us. I am looking forward to connecting with you again soon.